In this lesson, we're going to learn how to create this switcher component so that we can switch between viewing diary entries created by ourselves and diary entries created by other people. So if we look at the final design that we're going for here, this switcher is floating above the map here, right? It's overlaid on top of the map. So that gives us a giant clue as to what kind of element this is. And if you guessed a floating group, you of course would be absolutely right. So this is gonna be our floating group switcher, we could call it. And we want it to be floating relative to the bottom. We want it to be in the center. And yes, we wanna reduce the height. I'll just reduce it a little bit so we've still got some area to play with here. So that might get us kind of the basic area where we're gonna build this module, but what actually is going on here? Like what is this element? We're able to switch between a couple of different modes here. So for this, we can actually use this selectable list input that we have seen before. And this might be our selectable list map mode. And of course, a selectable list element lets the user choose between a number of items of one of our data types. And what we've got here are basically two choices, right? We've got inspiration, we've got my trips. So these two choices, the inventory, so to speak, of options, where do you think we could store these? Well, we are already doing something very similar to this on our trips page, where we have here this type filter that lets us choose from some predefined set of trip types. And if you recall, we set that up also using a selectable list element and what did we feed it here? What were the types of choices, the list of things that a user could choose from? It was this trip type, which of course is an option set. So option sets, again, are gonna to be to the rescue here. They're a really versatile feature of Bubble that lets us add any kind of reference data like this set of two choices that we wanna have here in our map switcher. So let's set that up. Let's go into our data tab, option sets, and let's create a new option set here. We could just call these map views or even map modes. And then just simply create a couple of options and we can just label these as we want them to appear to the end user. So this could be inspiration or, or community. I think the way to frame it in our app is inspiration. You're getting inspiration from diary entries that other people have added. And now that we have that option set set up, we can set the type of choices here to be map modes. And which specific map modes? Well, all of them, right? This one and this one. And the way that we tell this selectable list element, grab all of them, is by setting this choices source to simply all map modes. And also when the user navigates to the map view, one of these modes should already be pre-selected. So we can determine which one is pre-selected here using this default value. So I might just call it my trips. That's gonna be the default one that I wanna display. And then inside of this selectable list element, we've got the selectable list item. And inside of that, in turn, we have this one text element. And we could set this to be whatever the display value is for the specific mode that is in that row. So the way to do that, if we replace this static text with some dynamic data, is we can choose here the current items map modes display. And in fact, the way I've added this option set name is pluralized. It should really, so that this makes sense, be map mode. 
with multiple options, multiple map modes in that option set. Doesn't really matter too much though, either way. So with this setup, should we test this? Aha, okay. So this is how things are looking right now. There's obviously a few adjustments that we wanna make to the look of this. First and foremost, let's get these two options sitting next to each other, not on top of one another. So the way to set this up with the selectable list element is to add a fixed number of columns, the same amount of columns as the options that you want to display there horizontally. Right now it's looking like there's eight items here, but that won't be the case if we go and preview this. We'll see that we now have these two items side by side. And if we look at the edges here of this white box, that actually is the width of the floating group. So the floating group here is 320 pixels. If I turn off a fixed width, you see here how things expand the full width of the screen. 320, that might be a little bit too big. Let's see, let's see once we start designing things. So first things first, let's just get some canvas placeholders in here so we can see things a little bit more realistically. And I want this text element to be centered as well inside of this selectable list item. So on the selectable list item, which is a row layout, I'm gonna center align the label. And I'm just gonna get rid of the border here as well all together. And so this is how things are starting to look here. Let's make this group actually look like it's floating. So I'm gonna turn off here on the floating group, the minimum height altogether which is going to push the group down to the bottom. Let's bump it up a bit. And I'm gonna add here, very specific number actually, 28 pixels, which is enough that we can view here the Google logo, which is a requirement for using Google Maps. And equally, if we were gonna be using here Apple Maps, we're also clearing the, the Apple Maps logo and legal button, which is a requirement for using this map element on iOS. If we don't do this, then we risk our app being rejected by the app stores when we submit them later on. Now let's remind ourselves the look that we're going for here. So we've got sort of a rounded appearance and some obvious conditional formatting for the selected item. So let's work on the roundness first. So I'm gonna use a really bold number here, 40. And I'm even gonna add here just a little bit of a border, which is just gonna separate this floating group from the background just a touch. We'll also add a little bit of a box shadow. And I'm gonna set this to four just to start with. And we can see how things look from there. Okay, it's starting to look there. I think that shadow is way too strong for what it's worth. So I'm gonna bump that down to level two. We can see how that looks. And let's also get rid of all of this padding for now. We've got a fixed width, so I'm not worried about the width, but the height is quite high. And then let's just make sure that we're centering the text within the group here. Okay, that's starting to look a bit better. We could probably reduce the width just a little bit. So on the floating group, let's set the fixed width to 240 instead. And I'm actually gonna bump that shadow down even more. And okay, this is starting to come together. Right now though, our selected state looks a little bit broken. So we can work on the conditional formatting now for these two options. And if we click on the selectable list item itself, it's actually got kind of some weird uh, default conditions that have come here. So I'm actually gonna remove all of these conditions. And I'm gonna remove them on the text element as well. And what I'm also gonna do, I'm gonna turn off fit width to content on my text element. I'm gonna have it actually stretch the full width of the cell, so to speak and then just make sure that it is centered horizontally, and I'm gonna tick this center the text vertically. And the reason that I am doing this is because I actually wanna set a background style on this text element to get this effect here. And I wanna do that rather than set the background 
on the selectable list item, which of course also lets me add a background style. And the reason I want to do that is because on the text element, but not on the selectable list element, on the text element, I have access here to something we haven't seen yet, which are transitions, little animations. And you can see that here when I'm changing the selected state, there is an ever so slight little animation going between the two. It doesn't just hard cut from one to the other. It sort of appears to almost slide across. So we can get that effect by using here a transition. So let me show you how that works. I'm going to add a condition which is going to change the background color of this text element whenever the selectable list item that it's in is selected. So I can do that by going this selectable list item is selected. That's a state of the particular cell in this selectable list item element. Then of course I can change the background style and I'm going to set this to be a flat color and then which color is just going to be our text color. Since I'm changing or inverting the colors here, I should probably also change the font color so that the text is still legible. And I want to show you how this looks right away without any transition. So we've obviously got a little bit of cleanup here, but if I click on inspiration, you see how it just switches hard between the two here. But what I can do to smooth this transition is on the text element, I can choose the property that when it is being changed will change with this little animation. So in our case for the text element, that's the background style. And then I can choose here a type of transition and I'm just going to choose it ease in and out and then a duration in milliseconds, which I'm just going to say is 200 milliseconds as the default. And now when I switch between these tabs, you see how it's just a little bit smoother. So that's a nice look. Let's make the corners of this text rounded so it actually looks neat. So I'm going to do that by adding the same amount of roundness to the text element as we applied to the outer floating group. And you can see that looks a lot better already. Probably a little bit too much padding around the outside of this element. So on the selectable list element itself, we've got this padding of eight pixels by default all the way around. I could bump that down to four and see how that looks. And yeah, I think that looks a lot a lot better. So here's our switcher element basically complete. How do we actually connect it to our map logic so that when my trips is selected, we're just viewing all of my own trips on this map. And when inspiration is clicked, we are viewing all of the diary entries from other users created in the last 30 days. So the way to do that is we're going to add a workflow to the selectable list item. So when the user actually clicks one of these items, we're going to add a workflow. And that workflow is actually going to do something to the map. So we're going to come down to element actions. And we've got some options here that correspond to the map element. Display markers on a map and clear markers on a map. So we're going to display markers on a map. And what we can do here is we can say, okay, when they hit inspiration, and only when they hit inspiration, so we'll add a condition here which says when the current items map mode is inspiration. And now we can say what list of diary entries do we want to display on the map? Because the map, of course, is configured to hold a list of diary entries. And conveniently for us, we kind of already set up the data source that we want here, which is only diary entries that have a location, that are public, and that have been created within the last 30 days. So what I could just do is just right click on this expression, copy it, go back into the workflow tab and just paste this expression in here. And this is going to mean that when the user hits inspiration, 
that they view the community diary entries. So we've set that up for inspiration. We also need to set it up for my trips. So if I just copy and paste this action, we can now change this to be the inverse. So when it's my trips that has in fact been selected, well, then we want to find diary entries that, yes, don't have an empty location. Public, we don't actually care anymore. Date, we don't actually care. The only other thing that we care about is that they are the diary entries that the current user has actually created. So we can use this created by field and we can check is the value of that field equal to the current user. And this data source also should be, if I go and copy it, this should be the default data source for this map when it's loaded. So right now, when we load this map tab, my trips is the default value that we chose. And if you remember, we did that within the selectable list inside of this default value. And so it only makes sense that we need a default data source that will be used for this map when it is first shown, i.e. when the view is first loaded here, that matches that default my trips selection. So I'm going to paste the expression that I had just copied to my clipboard, which was the search expression only returning the diary entries created by the current user. And so let's test this out. These are some diary entries created by me. I think if I hit inspiration, I should see a bunch more, and I do. Now we could explicitly filter out our own diary entries as well whenever inspiration is clicked so that we're only ever viewing other people's diary entries. And the way to do that is on this data source here, we are actually going to check that the created by field is not the currently logged in user. And we can do that by using this operator here. So this reads as the created by is not the current user. So that if I change between these now, you can see that there are different trips appearing on the map. Okay, and so this is our final result. Looks like somewhere along the way here, I added back this safe area on this view. So if that's confusing you, literally all we have to do is toggle off here, show safe area, and voila, the map takes up the full height of the viewport, as we call it. Okay, so our map feature is feeling pretty good. In the next lesson, we're gonna change tack slightly, and we're gonna talk about file security. Fun topic. See you in the next one.